It was like waking up from a bad dream, only a little worse. Despite the lack of a blindfold, I couldn't see anything. I was all curled up and lying on my side. My hands were bound in front of me by something that was cutting my wrists. It was sharper and less bulky than the rope. My feet were bound as well, but I couldn't tell anything else since I was still wearing my work boots. It didn't take a genius to realize that I was in the trunk of a car. My brain was working overtime, but to no avail. I had a headache and a pain in the back of my head. The struggle was just making me uncomfortable. There was nothing I could do. I wasn't gagged, but there didn't seem to be any point in screaming. The car rumbled across some railroad tracks, and I was thrown slightly so that I hit my head and elbow on something hard. Hell, I was in the trunk of the car, so it could have been anything. After the second set of railroad tracks, I felt the car turn onto a gravel road. It was rougher than asphalt and much noisier. I slid onto the back of the trunk as the car began to climb up the hill. My brain started working. Where in the neighborhood were there any roads with a slope? Nothing was coming up, and I wasn't finding any answers. A few more minutes passed, and the road went from gravel to completely rough. It was no longer a road, but a trail. Everything hurt now. Every rock in the road caused another bruise when I hit it. And then everything went quiet. The car had stopped and the engine was off. My body was pressed against the back of the trunk. I was no longer trying to figure out where I was. All I could think about now was what was going to happen next. My mind was working at full capacity, but it was unwise to report it. I waited in silence until I heard the trunk latch open, the driver's door open and close. Another door followed. Was there really two? I opened my eyes to see a dim light coming in through the cracked trunk lid. It wasn't electric light, but something more natural. The trunk lid suddenly opened, and flashlight light hit me in the face. My eyes squinted, reacting to the brightness so I could no longer pretend I wasn't reacting. I tried to turn my head away from the light while my eyes adapted. It didn't work. Okay, asshole, get out of the trunk. I knew right away that whoever this guy was, he wasn't my friend. I struggled a bit, but couldn't lift myself up enough to get out of my mini prison. You're kidding, right? There's no way I'm getting out of here like this. My eyes still hadn't adapted to my surroundings due to the constant light in my face. I heard my master let out a few grunts, mixed with light curses as he cut the plastic straps binding my legs together. Unceremoniously throwing my legs over the back seat of the car, he set me almost on the ground. He stepped back a little and shined a flashlight toward my feet. As I climbed out of the car, I noticed there was only one guy there. The shovel was leaned against the side of the car. I quickly realized that it was lying on the back seat of the car. It was a big, burly guy, over six feet and at least 250 pounds. I had seen him before but couldn't remember where. He held a flashlight in his left hand and a revolver in his right. It looked like a .38 caliber police revolver, but not heavy enough to be a .357 caliber revolver. The big man pointed the flashlight toward a hill where a chain was strung across the side of the road. I recognized it. It was the fire trail that led to the top of Neversink Mountain to the ranger station. I had looked over my shoulder and was now looking at the city lights. The whole town was visible from here, and it was beautiful at night. The fire trail leading to the top was not open to the public. I stood on the mountain road with my hands tied in front of me and a gun pointed at my back. I tried to figure out what I had pissed this guy off with, but I couldn't think of anything. He had turned off the flashlight, and now all we had was the light of the moon. It was a warm glow that I could see through the crack in the trunk lid. The big guy slipped the flashlight into his jacket pocket and picked up a shovel. He waved the gun in my direction and growled one word. Move. The moonlight was bright enough to follow the fire trail without difficulty. Every now and then it would get darker due to clouds or trees, but that didn't stop us from walking. Everything was uphill, and everything was uneventful. I was distracted from my thoughts trying to figure out how the park people were getting their cars onto this damn road. The big guy kept tripping over rocks on the trail, and each time it was accompanied by a swear word. Interestingly, he was big, but clumsy. In some places, fallen leaves made the surface of the trail slippery, which seemed to annoy my master even more. Stop! That sudden command was followed by another. Move! The flashlight was on again, shining to the right. 
There was something of a flat spot ahead, as flat as could even be expected given the terrain of the mountain. It was only a few feet to the hole in the ground. Things were a little clearer now. I guessed what was waiting for me, but I still didn't know why. It was a crappy hole. It wasn't square and was only about four feet deep at one end and maybe two feet deep at the other. A large rock lay in the center of the shallow part. What kind of idiot decided to dig a grave on the rockiest hill in the whole neighborhood? It wasn't just rock. It was granite. There were hundreds of coal silt seams in the county that would have been very easy to dig in. The big guy held a flashlight and shovel in his left hand and a gun in his right. He motioned for me to move closer to the hole and I decided that wasn't a good idea. There had to be an alternative. He stood directly behind me as I moved forward. As soon as I got the feeling that I was about to be pushed, I bent over, turned, and lunged at him. I tried to get behind him so that I could have a chance to push him. My plans were ruined by a very loud gunshot and a searing pain in the right side of my chest. The son of a bitch shot me as he was falling into the hole. I didn't fall. I just sat on my ass pretty hard. I noticed that trying to breathe wasn't the best idea. But what the hell was the alternative? While I was lamenting my bad luck, I noticed the big brute swearing and moaning at the same time. It looked like I'd managed to get him, not myself, into the hole. Overcome with pain, I bent down and examined the bottom of the supposed resting place. My opponent had obviously broken his ankle when he fell into my grave. He was holding onto his right leg and sort of swaying back and forth. A flashlight was lying on the ground next to him, which created an eerie glow inside the pit. It was an opportunity, but an opportunity to do what? There was no way I could run with a hole in my chest. I could barely breathe, let alone walk. On the other hand, there was no way he could chase me with a sore ankle. I assumed it was broken, but maybe it was just a sprain. He was still holding the gun somewhere down there. That wasn't good. Since the gun now seemed to be my biggest problem, I decided something had to be done about it. As I struggled to get to my feet, I coughed from the abundance of blood. It filled my mouth and ran down my chin. I breathed in short gulps. There was no way in hell I could even think about taking a deep breath. I hesitated at the edge of the opening for a moment, then jumped in, feet first, right on top of him. I was glad I was still wearing my work boots. My left foot went right into the big guy's head, and my right boot went into his neck. I heard a loud crack and found myself lying on top of him. It hurt like hell. It hurt to move. It hurt to cough, and I coughed a lot. The flashlight was nearby, and I grabbed it first thing. The big beast was silent. He wasn't cursing or moaning anymore. I shined the light on his face. No reaction. I didn't check for a pulse, but I figured I'd either killed him or rendered him unconscious. Either way, it was a good thing. The bright red blood I'd drenched myself and the big brute with was clearly visible in the light. I knew what that bright color meant. I had a hole in my lung. If I didn't get help soon, I was going to choke on my own blood. I grabbed the gun that lay next to the flashlight, then rummaged through the big man's pockets until I found my cell phone and another discarded cell phone. Getting out of the hole was easier than I thought. I simply stepped over his body to the big rock on the end and then onto solid ground. It was only a few feet to the trail. I sat down with my back against one of the sassafras trees that dotted the hill and pulled out my cell phone. 911, what's your emergency? Hello, I'm on the Neversink Mountain Fire Trail and I need help. Sir, this area is off limits. Access is for park personnel only. She sounded young and like she was trying her best to be professional. I know that, dumbass. I've been shot and there's a dead man lying on the ground next to me. I need an ambulance and the police. I don't need a lecture on the rules of personal property. There was a brief pause on the other end of the line. Sir, an ambulance crew has been dispatched to your location. I'm also notifying the local and county police. Please keep your cell phone on. It will help us locate you. Sir? 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 Are you there? Are you okay? Hell no, I'm not okay. I've been shot. I'm going to hang up right now. This little episode ended with me having another coughing fit. Most of the liquid coming out of my mouth was dripping down my jacket. I had no doubt that it was bright red blood. I tried to breathe steady and even, which wasn't easy considering the pain. My eyes blurred and I realized I was sweating madly. The cool night air felt cold when it hit my damp skin. I had a choice. 
wallow in pain and misery, or try to figure out what the hell was going on. This guy put a lot of effort into it. There had to be a good reason for what he did. It wasn't an accident. It was planned. Why did he have a disposable cell phone? I took his cell phone out of my pocket and stared at it for a long time. It was going to answer all the questions. Someone else was involved in this case, and the cell phone recording would tell me who. Now was not a good time to check the phone. I was too excited and too unstable. I carefully put it back in my jacket pocket. I was just beginning to think of other people who might have been interested in my demise when I heard sirens wailing in the distance. Who had a grudge against me, or who would benefit from my disappearance? If it was for insurance, the big brute wouldn't have tried to hide my corpse. They needed the corpse to get the insurance claim. It had to be something else, but what? The sirens were getting louder and louder. I didn't know how much time had actually passed, but they seemed to be responding better than I expected. Flashing lights appeared now and then between the trees as the car climbed the hill. I hoped it would be the medics first. I shined my flashlight down the trail and saw the big guy's car about a hundred yards away. If I could see the car, the police and medics could see me. Two minutes later, an ambulance became visible. The last thing I remembered was dropping the flashlight. I woke up with a headache. My eyes were still closed, but my head hurt like hell. I was trying to push all thoughts away from me and figure out where I was when I decided it would be faster if I looked around. Once I squinted a little, I realized the answer and mentally sighed in relief. The mint green walls were the first thing I noticed, but the hospital smell followed. As I inhaled, the right side of my chest ached. It brought me back to reality very quickly. I remembered the shooting, the mountain, and the ride in the trunk of the car. It wasn't a dream. It was all real, but that didn't make it any better. I was fucking thirsty, but my mouth felt like shit. When I tried to put my hand to my mouth, I realized I had an IV or some kind of tube hooked up to me. I wouldn't have been able to touch my mouth anyway because I had a plastic mask over my face. It was breathing for me. Or at least helping me breathe. Dad, you're awake. Welcome back. Welcome to the real world. Turning my head in the direction of the voice, I squinted and saw my son, Brian. What the hell are you doing here? Why aren't you in school? Brian was attending Pennsylvania State University and I didn't want him to miss class, especially since I was paying tuition to have him there. It's okay, I needed a break. I have a week off. Relax. I took a quick look around the room. It was small and it didn't look like I shared it with anyone else. There were no flowers, thank God, but there were three mylar balls hanging from the ceiling in one corner. I finished looking around and looked at the balloons again. Where did they come from? Brian laughed lightly and smiled. They came from the Oompa Loompa. She comes in here twice a day and brings one each time. I tried to laugh but had to cut the laughter short. What's an Oompa Loompa? I don't know, Dad. I've never seen her before. She's about five feet tall and the same width. Wears a blue uniform. I thought at first she was some kind of mint girl or whatever they call them. You mean the candy saleswoman? Yeah, I guess so. So much for polite conversation. I started thinking about my situation again. I had questions that needed answers. I noticed that Brian gave some sort of signal to one of the nurses walking by. I assumed that my resurrection was something they were looking forward to. Brian, do you happen to know what's wrong with me? Dad, you've been shot. You've got, let's see. My son was trying to find something on the clipboard on the edge of the bed. Ah, here it is. You have a pneumothorax? In English, please. You have a hole in your right lung where some guy shot you. Yes, I think I remember that now that you mention it. For a few moments, we both sat in silence. I gathered my thoughts and assumed my son was patiently waiting for the doctor to show up. How long have I been here? Over two days. Damn, this must have been worse than I thought. Where's your mom? Why isn't she here? His silence was deafening. I was about to repeat the question, but decided not to. I just stared at him. I watched my son fidget in his chair for a few moments before answering. She's in jail, Dad. Grandpa Simmons is trying to bail her out, but he's having no luck. That doesn't make sense. Why is your mother in jail? Dad, 
She's being charged with conspiracy to commit murder and half a dozen other things. She's also charged with the death of that guy you stomped in that pit. And, and what the hell are you talking about? Who was she trying to kill? The guy who kidnapped me? No, you killed that guy, but she's being blamed for his death because she hired him to kill you. One of the machines behind me started beeping, and Nurse Ratchet or her sister ran into the room. The news my son had dropped on me had done wonders for my blood pressure. She asked Brian to leave and then gave me some kind of injection. Before the injection took effect, I coughed into the mask placed over my face. It turned out to be one hell of an unpleasant picture. I decided to relax a bit, and the shot she gave me willingly helped. About that time, a doctor came into the room and examined me. He was checking things out as fast as he could, but I didn't care anymore. I just wanted to take a nap, if only for a little while. I don't know how long it was until I opened my eyes again. It was darker, and the hospital corridors seemed quieter. I looked around the room. There were four Mylar balloons standing in the corner. An unfamiliar man in a dark suit sat in the chair where Brian had sat earlier. He was reading a magazine, but at the same time looked bored. Taking advantage of the lull, I examined my body. Besides the IV in my arm, I had some kind of tube in my chest that looked like something was leaking out of it. A bandage covered a very painful spot in the middle of my throat, just below my Adam's apple. My entire torso was wrapped in bandages or gauze. The mask on my face was replaced by a plastic tube inserted into my nose. It seemed to help me breathe. The machines didn't beep, just hummed. Hi, my name is Stan Trumbull, and you are? Mr. Suit seemed pleased that I was awake. I got the feeling he'd been here for quite some time. I'm Detective Daniel Green. I heard you were awake, and I was hoping to give you a few minutes. Okay. Just don't say anything that might piss me off, or I'll get another shot of La La Land. He pulled his chair closer to the hospital bed. Can I have something to drink? No. Damn, how determined. Here. Detective Green unwrapped a lozenge that was lying on the stand next to the bed and put it in my mouth. They specifically said no liquids. The sweet disc felt pleasant in my mouth, but a cold beer would have been better. Mr. Trumbull, did you know the man who took you to Never Sink Mountain three days ago? No, he seemed familiar, but I don't remember meeting him before. My son said I killed him. Yes, that's right. Broken neck. I didn't mean to kill him, I just wanted to get away. Don't worry about that. No one holds you responsible for his death. My son also said you blame my wife for his death. Is that true? Yes but we can discuss all that later. The answer didn't make me happy, but I believe there was a reason he phrased it that way. So, who the hell was this guy and why was I there? His name was Carmine Nunizo. He was Richard Herring's own brother. Do you know Dick Herring? Sure. Everyone knows Dick Herring, the king of mattresses. My wife Darlene works for him. As soon as the words left my mouth, I had an epiphany. Darlene had worked at Herring Bedding for almost ten years. For the first few years, she complained constantly about Richard. He was a bad manager, a bad supervisor, and a tosser. For the last year or so, she hadn't said anything about him at all. That should have been the first clue. She started working overtime at the store because they were forced to cut back on office staff. She also started attending seminars and business expos that were nearby, some of them overnight. Up until now, I hadn't thought about any of this. I trusted her completely. Mr. Trumbull, do you understand where this is going, or do I need to elaborate a bit? No, unfortunately, I think I have one. I don't like it, but I have it. I pointed to the counter by the bed, and Detective Green unwrapped another pasty for me. Detective, I understand the where, when, and who, but can you tell me why? The Herring Bedding Company is going under. Richard Herring is broke. You have over $2 million in life insurance. Mr. Herring and your wife plan to keep the company alive with the insurance money she received after your death. But how were they going to get the money if they buried my body? Your grave was to be discovered by a group of bird watchers the following week. Twice a year, 
Migratory airplanes fly through the area, and birdwatching groups are allowed to come over the mountain during that time. How did you find out about all this? Did they come forward and confess? Not exactly. The cell phone you took off Carmine's body had records of calls he made to his brother-in-law and your wife. We checked the calls on Dick Herring's cell phone and on your wife's phones. It turned out to be quite interesting. Are you telling me you have enough information from those phones to charge my wife with murder? No. We got it all from Mr. Herring. When he found out he was being charged with his brother-in-law's murder, as well as attempted murder, he couldn't start talking fast enough. He had a lawyer, and he cut a deal before your wife even realized what was going on. Once she found out Herring had turned against her, she confessed to everything and tried to blame it on him. She decided to plead guilty so she wouldn't have a trial, but she'll probably get a harsher punishment than Herring. Well, that sucks for her. Was it his idea or hers to kill me? We don't know. We may never know. It's a good thing you're still alive. Do you really want something from me, Detective Green? No, not really. I wanted to make sure you were okay and also bring you up to speed on what happened. I'd rather you hear about it from me than read about it in the papers. Do you have any more questions? I thought for a few moments. Yes, who the hell is bringing me these balloons? The man in the suit laughed softly. Her name is Donna, and she said if you wake up I should tell you, and her last name is Dimwit. I threw him a perplexed look and he smiled. She's the 911 operator who took your call. She said you called her a dumbass and she realized at the time she was acting that way. She was new to the job and felt very uncomfortable about saying something stupid. He must have left the room right after that because the next thing I knew, it was dawning on me. Brian was by my side again and helped me with the first tray of food. Darlene was denied bail, and sentencing was at the end of the month. Dick Herring made bail and disappeared. His business was going under, and he had no family. That was the day I finally met Donna Dimwit. She was short, stocky, and full of life. Although she was a registered nurse, her weight made it difficult for her to get a job. She couldn't work on an ambulance crew because of the physical agility requirements. The 911 service became her best option. I was released from the hospital after three days, but needed home care for another two weeks. Donna was listed as a visiting nurse, and with one phone call, I was able to arrange for her to take care of my needs. Darlene was sentenced to ten years, but Brian said she would probably be out in eight. I never got to see her before she left for Muncie. She never tried to contact me, and I never intended to call her. Poor Brian was caught in the middle, and I promised not to blame him for anything. Two weeks later, I filed for divorce. Donna made macaroni and cheese for dinner.